I want to ask, how was your week? Was your week good? If it's good, raise your hand. Was your week bad? If it's bad, raise your hand. Did you have a bad week? Anybody have a bad week? There's one. There's one. You know, that's the way it works, isn't it? Not everybody has the same experience each day. Some of us have a rough experience. Some of us have a good experience. But this life, for one thing, we do know this, is this life is full of hills and it's full of valleys. It's full of mountaintops and it's full of low, low valleys. And between each mountaintop, there's a valley. It's just the way things work, okay? And God wants us, whether we're on the top or whether we're in the valley, he wants us to be consistent with our relationship with him. You see? Maybe the things we experience will be extremely different at different times. Maybe we'll have our highs and our lows, but he says, but where are you at as far as your heart? Is your heart constant with me? That's where God wants us to be, constant with him. That means we're instant in season and out of season. That means that we're ready to give an answer to anybody who would ask concerning the hope of our calling. That means that we're willing to be used of God at any time, even when we don't feel like it. I'll tell you, there's sometimes, you know, we, we go out every Thursday and we pray for people out on the streets, and there's sometimes I don't feel like it. But you know what? I'm committed. I have to go because other people expect me to go. And you know what? Every time I go, it's like God energizes me because he's like, I want you to be somebody who shows up even when nobody shows up. I want you to be somebody who's consistent, somebody who's faithful. And I've had some of the, some of the most immense, enormous miracles I've ever seen were on days that I didn't even want to be out there. I didn't even feel it. But once I saw God moving, that changed everything. So sometimes it's not a matter of just looking outside and going, well, it's a cloudy day, I'm depressed. It's a matter of saying, no matter what it is, I'm going to do what God called me to do. And when you're faithful, God will bless you. God will bless you. God will bless you. Today, we have a message. This title is Time to Go. Time to Go. So I'm going to ask you the question. Are you comfortable about where you're at in your spiritual life right now? How many people are comfortable about where you're at right now in your spiritual life? Okay. I'd say that's probably 10%, 20%. That means there's 80% that are not comfortable where they're at in their spiritual life. Are you ready to settle down right now where you're at and just stay there? Have you traveled as far as you're going to travel in this spiritual walk and you are where you are because that's the best it's ever going to be? And really, you need, all you need to do now is maintain where you're at. How many people are there? You just want to maintain where you're at. Nobody wants to maintain where they're at. I'm not saying that you're completely satisfied with where you're at today. I'm simply saying, is this as far as you want to go? Or do you want to go further? You know, I've been saved for almost, well, around 50 years. I'm still not there. I'm still not where I want to be. Maybe it's been a journey over many years, and at some point, you're just going to have to just resolve yourself to the fact you've got to put your tent away, pack it up, and put it in storage. You've got to build your house, you've got to plant your crop, and you've got to settle down right where you're at. Maybe that's the way it works. Have you reached a town in your journeying? Have you reached a town which we might call complacency? The definition of complacency is a feeling of quiet pleasure or security, often while unaware of some potential, potential danger, defect, or the like. Self-satisfaction or a smug satisfaction with an existing situation or condition. Well, here's five signs of complacency. Number one, you're no longer striving to do your best. Number two, you're not staying up to date in your learning and growing process, but you're leaning on past accomplishments. Number three, you're not seeking or taking advantage of new opportunities for learning and growing. You're not challenging yourself. Number four, you're not maintaining or building your connection with others who are continuing to grow. It, it matters who you surround yourself with. Number five, you don't risk sharing your opinion, your thoughts, because you're just unsure of what you actually believe anymore. 
There's a lot of people that are in this place. They're kind of like an in-between place. Kind of like I used to be on fire for the Lord. Now I'm not turned against the Lord. I'm just kind of in this middle place. Today we're going to look at a man who was on a spiritual journey, and his commitment to, the jur- to this journey lasted his whole life. He never stopped journeying. So Abraham is the man called by the Jews the father of the faith. And his life represents one man's journey to establish a deep personal relationship with the one and true living God. Let's read a little bit about Abraham's family and how he got started on his journey right now. Genesis 11, starting with verse 27. So open your Bible, open your app, whatever it is. Genesis 11, 27 through 31 says this. This is the account of Terah's family line. Now, Terah is Moses' father. Terah became the father, I mean, Abraham's father. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father, Terah, was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took Abraham his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. So Abraham's father, Terah, took Abraham and his existing family that, you know, was still around. Abraham, his wife, his, uh, basically his grandson or nephew, uh, Abraham's nephew. And he took all these folks and they went on a trip from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. That's, that was the plan. A journey to relocate from one place to another. We don't know exactly what motivated Abraham's father to do that, but it was in his heart. So what was in Canaan land? Why go from Ur of the Chaldeans to Canaan land? What's what's in Canaan land? Well, I don't know exactly if it was just because uh, Canaan land is the land the Bible talks about was flowing with milk and honey. So maybe it's a land of great abundance. I don't know what motivated Terah, but I have to believe no matter what he thought motivated him, what was behind it was God's plan. God's plan. So God had stirred him to want to go to Canaan land. And the city we would be most familiar with that exists exists in Canaan, wasn't called this at the time, but the city that exists in Canaan that is most familiar to us is Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is in the center of what we called Canaan land. And you know, Jerusalem plays a huge part in the scriptures. It's a very important place for them to get to. So Abraham's father and all their family began this journey together. And when they reached Haran, now listen to this. It's about halfway. It's 600 miles away from Ur, where they started. And about 500 miles away from Jerusalem, they settled. So when they're halfway to Canaan land, they stopped, and they stopped in Haran, and they didn't just stop for a coffee break. They settled there. The Hebrew word for settle here is the word yeshab, which means to sit down, remain, and dwell. They didn't take a break. They didn't stop for a drink. They didn't stop to get some provisions. They settled there. They unpacked their stuff. They pitched their tents. They built their houses. They planted their fields. They put down their roots permanently. They didn't make it to Canaan. They made it about halfway, and they said, this is good enough. Now, there's all kinds of things you can think about when you first get saved, about how you just want to give your whole life to the Lord and do everything for God and be everything you can be. But a lot of people halfway through the journey settle down at some spot in between, in between what you really desired and where you started. They settled. Now let's pick up where we left off in Genesis 11 with 11.32. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. That's as far as his journey went. Abraham and his family at that point became citizens of Haran. They stayed there. This became their new home. 
They got land of their own there. They raised their children there. They established themselves there. They called it home. Haran was now home. It wasn't Canaan. It was halfway. Then for the first time in the scriptures, we see mention of the fact that the Lord visited Abraham. And that's Genesis 12, 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country. You see, now Haran was his country. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. That's where his father had, had uh, left them and where he died. To the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I would make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So Abram was 75 years old when God said, I'm going to do a new thing in your life. 75 years old, he had vineyards planted, he had many uh, uh, cattle and slaves, he had all this stuff all settled down in Haran, that's where his father had died, where his father's grave was, and God says, leave, at 75. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother, and all their possessions that they had gathered to and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. That's where they were originally going to go when they began their journey at the beginning. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram pray, uh, passed through the land to a place called Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At the time, Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards Negeb. Negeb is a desert region just south of Jerusalem. So once again, we read in Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land I will show you when Abraham is 75 years old. About the time that people decide, I've already dreamt my big dreams, I've already done my big pursuits, now it's time to settle down. It's time to say, we're done pursuing new things. I've accomplished what I think I'm going to accomplish in this life, and I'm good with that. And I'm going to settle down right here. The time that you resign yourself to settling in where you're at and you take your foot off the gas and you go, now I'm just going to coast a little bit. I pushed hard all my younger parts of my life and now I'm just going just gonna to settle down. At that time, when people settle down, the Lord said, go. But I'm just settling in. I've got a nice piece of land here. I've developed it. I've got crops. I've got... Uh, uh, cattle. I've got slaves. I've got possessions, great amount of possessions. I like where I'm at. I like what I have. The Lord said, go. Go somewhere that I will show you. Now, what do you think Abraham was thinking when he's got everything all set up? He's 75. He's ready to retire. And the Lord says, go. Like, go? Abraham was thinking, but Lord, we're pretty established here. I mean, this is my father's resting place. And this is where we planted our roots and where we intend to grow old and finally die. Isn't it a little late in life to start some new venture into the unknown, Lord? I mean, if I leave my land, I leave a huge asset behind because you can't take your land with you and that's worth something. I got to leave it all behind. So you want me now at this point in my life at 75 to start over from scratch? In a strange land where I don't know anybody? And the Lord says, yes. How about I think about it? And I'll get back to you later. Now, you know this is true. When you ask a brother or a sister, could you please do something for me? And they say, let me pray about it. That means no. Let me pray about it means i got to have time to think of a better excuse than just no. (sighs) 
So anyway, how about I talk it over with my relatives, Lord, and we vote on it? And then we go with the majority. No, just go. But this is where our father brought us, and this is where he settled us. And he took a long journey to get us here, and he decided this was a good place for us to stay. This is a good place to establish ourselves. This is my father's country now. Lord said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Can you tell me the name of that land? Go, and I'll tell you when you get there. Do you suppose Abraham said, great, I'll pack now? Do you think it was that easy? See, we always think in the Bible, you know, we get the short story. Well, God told him to go, and he went. Oh, there was no problems. Are you kidding me? There was no problems. He's got to tell his whole family we're going to just uproot and go. And where are we going, Dad? I don't even know. You think there's no problem there? You try that with your family. And you tell me there's no problem there. You tell your family, God said for us to uproot here and go, and we don't even know where we're going. You try that, see how that works for you. Do you think that Sarah was on board right away with the fact that her husband said, God spoke to me, and we have to leave, and we have to go to a place that I can't even tell you where it is? You suppose Sarah was supportive of that? Honey, you're the man. Whatever you say goes. What do you think Noah's wife was thinking when her husband said to her, God spoke to me, and we're supposed to spend the rest of our lives, our fortune, and all of our time building a really big boat in the middle of a desert? No. No. Do you think she said, honey, that sounds great. I'm glad God talks to you. I doubt it. What am I saying here? God is not against asking you to do things that will make you uncomfortable. He is not against it. In fact, he'd like to make you uncomfortable. You know why? There's part of the reason. It has to do with the, the righteous or bold as lions. It has to do with the fact he wants to challenge you where your fear is so that you can face your fear and overcome your fear, and suddenly it's no longer a fear. I mean, I take people out all the time who are afraid to go out in public and pray for people, and they're scared to death. And you know what? After a few times, they're not scared to death because they went out and did it. God's not against making you uncomfortable. He's not against asking you to do things that are unfamiliar or inconvenient. In fact, some of his favorite people that we read about in the Bible are people that he asked to do things that were very unfamiliar, very uncomfortable, and very inconvenient. He doesn't have a problem with that. But why did he ask these people to do these hard things for him? Why does he, he mess with people? The reason God messes with people is there's really one reason behind it all, so that he can bless them. See? He, he tests you. He messes with you. He calls you to do things because his purpose is to get you to the place where he can bless you because his desire is to bless you. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, your father's house to a land that I will show you. Listen, and this is what I'll do. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever cursed you, I will curse and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. So if you will go, a blessing will occur. A blessing not only for you, but for your family, for all people. If you'll just go and do the uncomfortable, inconvenient thing, I will bless you. And if you don't move, I can't bless you, but I want you to be blessed. Noah was told to build an ark, but that ark was to provide a blessing for his family because that ark was the salvation of his family. That's a blessing. Genesis 6, 17, 18. Talking about that ark. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, so you will live. So you will live because I want to bless you. Why did the Lord call Gideon, who was a nobody, to stand up against the Midianites who held Israel captive? Why did he pick a nobody? You think it was comfortable for Gideon to be called to say, hey, mighty man of valor? He's like, who are you talking to? You've got the wrong guy. 
Well, the Lord wanted to deliver and bless Israel. He wanted to deliver them from the hand of the Midianites. He wanted to bless Gideon and to make him into a great leader. And Israel was blessed with freedom from their oppressors all the days of Gideon's life, it says. All the days of Gideon. There was a blessing. God asked him to do something hard. Why? So he could bless him. You see, if you don't do what he says, you can't walk in the blessing, and he wants you to walk in the blessing. Why did the Lord... Pick a guy like David to stand up against Goliath because the Lord wanted to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. That's a blessing. Who intended to enslave them? And David was willing to step up and be God's instrument for deliverance so that God could bless David and make him the king. Right? 2 Samuel 7, 8 through 11. Lord speaking to Samuel, now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's army has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before, you, before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth, and I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they have done in the past. Starting from this time, I appoint and the judges to rule my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. Well, you'll do all that. Why? Because you did what I said. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you, and not only bless you, I'm going to bless the whole nation. I'm going to bless all the people. I'm going to bless your land. But, but Goliath's a scary guy. It's like if you just do what I ask you to do, it might be inconvenient. It might be unfamiliar. It might be scary. He says, I'll bless you. Why did the Lord call Gideon, who was a nobody? Because he wanted to bless the nation and Gideon. You see, why does the Lord call you to do anything great? Because he wants to bless you and those around you, those in your family. God asked many people to take many risks, many personal sacrifices, but in the end we see his intentions were so that he could bless them. You see, sometimes we get annoyed with God for asking us to do something uncomfortable. Don't ask me to do that. I can't tell you how many people I've met who give me this story. You know, um, I was on a bus, and there was a guy sitting across from me, and the Lord was speaking to me, go and pray for him. Go and do it. Go and do it. And I didn't do it, and now I feel terrible. I mean, how many times have you, anything like that happened to you? I know so many people. That's, I said, yeah, yeah, you feel terrible. So, you, and then they say, you know, if I, that ever happens to me again, I'm going to do it because I don't like the feeling of not doing it because I don't like this miserable feeling of feeling like I disobeyed the Lord. I, I want to just do it. Well, you see, why does God ask you to do that uncomfortable thing? Why couldn't he ask somebody else on the bus? Because he wants to use you, and he wants to bless you, and he wants to bless them through you. Right? Some of us, like myself, were not raised up in a household that taught about the Lord. But the Lord chose to reveal himself to me, maybe to you, just like he did Abraham. We're a bunch of nobodies just like Gideon. We got no fame. No one had heard of us. But he called us to do great works of deliverance of delivering people from bondage, from slavery, and setting them free. He's called us to do that, you and me, right? We are not from the most educated, elevated, or privileged homes, just like David. But God has called us to destroy the works of the adversary, to defeat him through the name of the Lord, and to display his triumph for all to see. That's what he's called you to. And then God has invited us to sit as a king on his throne with him and reign with him forever. Me? Me? Gideon? David? Yeah. Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Ephesians 2, 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Revelations 1, 5 through 6. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood, who has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. To, to nobody he said this? Yeah. So we shouldn't think it a strange thing when God asks you to pick up from your comfortable place where you planted yourself, even spiritually speaking, and go out and do what is uncomfortable, unfamiliar, inconvenient. Because with everything he asks comes a blessing. There's a blessing for obedience. Let's take all that we have talked about, and let's see how that can be applied to our lives today. 
Not just, that's what happened to Abraham. That's what happened to David. That's what happened to Noah. That's what happened to Gideon. How about, that's what happened to you. You may be just like me. Like I said, I've been saved for pretty much 50 years. I am where I am, spiritually speaking, right now. And I could assume that this is about how the rest of my life will go. And I shouldn't expect many new changes to occur at this point. I'm kind of there. I'm 50 years, you kind of got it figured out. That's what I could say. I guess I've gotten about as far as I can go in the Lord. And my usefulness to the Lord is pretty much used up. And my achievements, my, achievements, my accomplishments, my conquests, they're all now behind me, pretty much. Don't have much time left. I'm like Abram in Haran. I've settled down. This is my home. I should start taking my foot off the gas because I guess it's reasonable to think we're as far as we're going to go right now. I, like Abraham, am blessed right where I'm at right now. I don't lack anything I need. I'm pretty comfortable. I have a home that suits me just fine. I don't feel the need to start something new because I'm getting to the age of settling down and settling in. Maybe that's where you are also. That's exactly where Abraham was. He was 75. He was settled in. He's planning on spending the rest of his life right there where his father planted him. But God said to Abram, get up and go to the place I will show you. But Lord, don't you think it's a little late for that? Go. You know, two-thirds of God is go. Here's what we need to understand here. As long as you are breathing, God doesn't want you to stop and stay and settle where you are at when it comes to your spiritual journey. When Paul knew that his time was about up, when he would be put to death, here's what he said. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Is that clock right? It is right. Huh. Wow. We're going to get done a little early. That's okay. So when Paul knew that it was about the time where he was going to die, time was going to be up, here's what he said. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I'm ready being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. From now on, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge will award me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who crave his appearing. Now, when did Paul say that? Paul said that when he knew he was about to die. Because before he was about to die, Paul was not done. Paul even preached from prison. Paul wrote most of the epistles he wrote from prison. Paul did not stop serving from prison. Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen and it was illegal to crucify a citizen of Rome. And he was beheaded at the very last time in his life he knew it was coming. It was going to be any day now. And he says, okay, I've run this race to the end. I finished my course to the end. I fought a good fight to the end. I never gave up the whole time. He pressed forward. He pressed towards the finish line. He never retired. He never settled in, nor did any other apostle you could find in the scriptures. They kept going to the end. Abraham was 75. He had come a long way. He was ready to sit where he was, but God said, don't sit. Get up. God told him to do what was inconvenient, uncomfortable, because God had more he wanted to bless him with. God told Abraham if he would go, he would bless him. How? How? God would give Abraham all the good land of Canaan, all that he could see from the north, the south, the east, the west. He promised him children, not just one child, but as many as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore, innumerable, can't even be counted. Genesis 13, 14 through 16. After Lot had departed, the Lord said to Abram, now lift up your eyes from the place where you are and look to the north, the south, the east, and the west, for all the land you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. But what do I have to do, Lord? Get up, walk around the land through the length of it and the breadth of it, and I will give it to you. He said, get up again. He said, it's there before you. That's Genesis 13, 70. He says, the land is right there before you. He says, now get up and walk around, and I'll give it all to you. Ur of the Chaldees is where we started this journey. Ur is like the place where you were born into this world. That's where we got our first chance to live a life is we got born. We're here on earth. Now what do you do? 
okay? Haran is like the place where we first met the Lord. Some point in our journey in this life, we met the Lord, and we go, oh, I've established a relationship with God. Hey, this is good. Life is good. I'm with Jesus now. I'm saved. Everything's going to be okay. But God doesn't want you to stay where you got saved. Haran. He wants you to move on all the way to the promised land, okay? Jerusalem in the land of Canaan is like the final destination where you'll truly have arrived to your permanent home. But Haran is not your permanent home. That's a pit stop. And we've, many of us have settled up, set up our homes at our pit stop. We, mean, we took a break in Haran, but many of us said, and I'm going to die here. And God says, no, get up and go because you're not all the way there yet. And I've got a long way for you to go. And I've got a lot of things for you to see because I want to bless you. Right? Get up, the Lord said. For us, the end of the road is heaven. Until you reach heaven, you're still on the journey. The road between Haran and Jerusalem is a road that we're supposed to be traveling upon until we finally reach the promised land. And many of us got saved and got comfortable and got settled down in Haran, and we're where we were, and we're good enough with that. But God says, pick your stuff up, round up your people, and go move forward. The Lord doesn't care if you're 106. You are still alive, and God wants you to be on the move, endeavoring to get closer and closer to the land of promise. You've not seen all the miracles you're going to see yet. Well, I'm 50 years old, 60 years old. I've seen them all. No, you have not. Okay? You will never see them if you sit down, settle down, and stop moving forward. You have not received all the blessings that God wants to give you yet. But you may never receive those things if you just sit down and stop moving forward. You may not have achieved all of the victories and spoiled all of the enemies that you face in this life yet. But if you never accomplish those great exploits and you just sit down and stop moving forward, whose fault is it? Because God wants you to be victorious throughout your whole life. We cannot settle. We cannot let ourselves be seduced into complacency. We cannot stop running the good race, fighting the good fight, even if we're old. You can still be like Caleb. Caleb was old, and he says, give me that mountain. I'm going to take it. It's mine. And he took possession of it, and he said he was as strong as men half his age, right? Why? Because his spirit in him, the spirit in him. The good old days, you got good old days in your life? Oh, man, I remember back in the days, boy, church was something, and I was something, and I was on fire for the Lord. You were? What's wrong with you now? The good old days are gone. They're dead. They're past history. They're memories. And they don't have to be considered the best days. Because your best days can lay just ahead of you if you will just get up and go. Don't waste your time pining away about how close you used to be to the Lord, on how far you used to be, how on fire you used to be, on how God used to work in the services, on how you used to uh, see God manifest himself in your life. Because if you set your mind on the past, you'll never go forward. And God says, it's time to get up and get going because the best is yet to be. What time is it? It's time to go. It's time to get up. It's time to start moving so that God can give you every blessing he's intended for your life. Let's not give up. Let's not get weary. Let's press forward. doesn't matter how old you are. doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Galatians 6, 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessings if we don't give up. There's still more territory that the Lord wants to give us, but we cannot settle where we're at right now. Philippians 3, 12 through 15. Not that I have already, Paul's talking, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brother, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. He's still looking ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many of us that are mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this to you. He's saying, you mature ones, you ones who have been saved a long time, you ought to be of the mindset, it's time to get going. Not in the mindset, it's time to settle down. I remember, hard to believe, I remember when my wife and I were in this church years ago at the beginning, and there were certain old folks here. There were certain old folks here uh, who were faithful to come to church every week. 
But that was about all they were willing to do. They really were. So one elderly lady said to Paula and me, we did all of that stuff when we were younger. Now it's your turn. We're just going to sit back and watch. We did all that spiritual stuff, all that praising the Lord. We did all that when we were younger. Now it's time for us to sit back and watch you. That's what she said. Wrong. That lady had a really bad attitude when we first met her. I questioned if she was even saved. She seemed so bitter and angry. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And experiments have proven that's wrong. You can teach old dogs new tricks. You can indeed teach an old dog new tricks. And I'm happy to say that the Lord wasn't done with that cantankerous old lady. Because a few years later, her husband died. And the Lord really got a hold of her. And she became sweet. And it's like, what happened to you? She became wonderful and encouraging and supportive. And, and if she had never received the Holy Ghost before, I'm certain she received him then. She was a whole different person. It's like, what happened to this woman? All the way to her death, she was praising the Lord. And she was angry and mean and nasty. And said, you guys do the work. We're old. We're going to sit here and watch you do it. It's never too late to grow spiritually. It's never the end of your greatest experiences with the Lord if you'll just keep going forward. Don't stop where you're at. Don't settle for status quo. Press on forward deeper into the promised land and watch God perform new miracles and bring into your life new blessings that you've never seen before. So what time is it? It's time to go. You go, but I'm old. I'm settling in. Oh, wake up. Abraham was 75. If you're under 75, he's definitely talking to you. If you're over 75, he's still talking to you. Get up and go. Get up and go. Are you satisfied where you're at? Would you like better? Well, what if I told you better doesn't exist where you're at? Better exists ahead. Well, but I'm comfortable where I'm at. Yes, well, comfortable. You're comfortable where you're at. And so you say, I'm in my comfort zone. You know what your comfort zone is? It's a prison. Because when you walk up to the wall, you go, I can't cross that line. And I can't cross that line because that's uncomfortable. That's the uncomfort zone. I can't walk in, so I'm trapped right here in this comfort zone. Comfort zone is a prison. Throw that out. Just throw that out. Say, wherever the Lord asked me to walk, I'm going to walk. What if Gideon said no? Well, he finally said yes. What if David had said no? Well, he finally said yes. What if Abraham had said no? What if Noah had said no? No blessing. But look what happened. Look at the miracles that God did through their lives. What are you saying no to? Lord, I've had enough. I'm old enough. I've experienced all the good stuff. Now, I'm, now it's just time to sit back and just enjoy it until the end. The Lord says, you don't understand. The greatest days can be the ones ahead of you, not the ones you've already experienced. So many of us want to rest on our laurels and, and have this rich history of how good things used to be. Do you think God wants to take you, pluck you from the tree when you're not even ripe yet? He wants you to be your absolute sweetest and ripest. And how do you get there? By continuing on in the Lord. You know? You know? He wants to pick you when you're so at your sweetest and ripe. Not when you're sitting there rotting on the branch because you don't want to move. He wants us to move. And you go, well, I'm praying for that. Are you? Are you? Are you praying for that? Or are you just praying? God, just bless me to enjoy stuff and be okay. How about your spiritual growth? Nah, 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 I'm okay with that. How about you just bless me to enjoy stuff and keep all conflict from my life? And don't make me uncomfortable, please. Please, Lord. Give me a comfortable day, a comfortable day, a quiet day. Give me peace, Lord, from all my enemies. That's all I want. Well, I have big plans for you. I, never mind. I just want peace. The peace that passes understanding. Well, I've got some really good things for you ahead, blessings that are beyond your imagination. Lord, I'm, I don't want to be greedy. I'm good where I'm at. I'm happy with all that you've given me. Just maintain it, please. But what if I want to use you? Lord, there's others that are far more qualified than me. Yeah, didn't he? Lord, you couldn't use me. I mean, I'm flawed. Oh, Lord never used flawed people, did he? 
You know, if the Lord could never use flawed people, nobody would ever be used. Lord, I am unknown. I'm a small cog in this big gear of life. And there's other people that are much more prominent, important, and well-known than me that could do big things, not just me. You know, that's what Gideon said. You know, Gideon said, do you really understand who you're talking to? You call me a mighty man of valor. He says, do you really understand that my family is like the lowest of the low? And you realize in my family, I'm the runt of the litter? Yeah, I know, mighty man of valor. Oh, you got something wrong with you, man, because mighty man, it can't be me. He says, it's you because I'm going to make it you. Because when you obey me, I'm going to make you that. But you can't make me that. I can make you whatever I want to make you, as long as you'll come with the program. God wants to use you. You see, other people are bold enough to witness to people. Other people are bold enough to share their faith, but you're not. Well, you know what? The Lord says, if I ask you to, will you do it? And what are you going to say? No. So a lot of people, you know what they're afraid of? They're afraid of hearing the voice of the Lord. They don't want to hear the voice of the Lord. They only want to hear the voice of the Lord when it comes to him giving the answer of yes to their prayers. Lord, will you please give me this? Yes, that's all I want to hear. Lord says, hey, I have some things to talk about. No, that's all right. I have some assignments, assignments for you. No, no, ma, ma, no, they can't hear. Ma, no, can't hear. I want you to go to the neighbor that you hate so much and give them something and tell them that you're praying for them. Nope, nope, ma, 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 can't hear. Nope, nope, nope. And now, Lord, hear my prayer. Really? So are you comfortable where you're at? Do you want to stay where you're at? You don't want to lose ground. We all know that. But do you want to go forward? The Lord wants you to go forward. So if you want to go forward, what are you going to have to do? I guess you're going to have to apply yourself. I guess you're going to have to push yourself out of your comfort zone. And sometimes that comfort zone is going to be Monday night going to prayer. Sometimes the comfort zone is going to be Wednesday night going to Bible study. Sometimes your comfort zone is going to be participating in something with God's people so that you can grow, right? You go, but I'm comfortable where I, I'm okay where I'm at. God says, hey, look, a coffin is padded in line so you can be comfortable for the hereafter. But who wants to live in a coffin? Okay? All that padded walls and stuff is not all it cracks up to be. Life is outside of the coffin, not in the coffin. Right? Life is outside of your comfort zone. Lord, I guess this message is for the young folk. Yeah. Anybody that's under 100, this is what this message is for. It's for you. Anybody above 100 here? I guess it's for you then. So how many of you are saying, I don't know what to do with this message because, like, I hope it just goes away. And I hope Tom just stops because I want to forget this one and move on to next week's message, probably better. How about the Lord says, no, I want you to be in the uncomfort zone right now. I want you to put yourself in the place where it's uncomfortable. And I want you to say, Lord... I'm willing to go. Lord, I'm willing to do. Lord, I'm willing to break the mold and get out of my complacency and do the things you asked me to do, even if they're crazy and unfamiliar and inconvenient. I'm willing to do it. That's the person he's looking for. That's the person. And it might only be one, but that's the person he's looking for. Are you that person? Are you the one that's not going to move? You're done. We can just put your feet in concrete and leave you right where you're at. You're not going anywhere. Does anybody here want to see their best days ahead, not behind? So where have you gotten to spiritually? You realize you're not there yet? You realize there's so much more ahead for you? And you realize it'll take that same kind of zeal you had when you were younger where you said, I'm going to push forward because i got a long ways to go. you still got a long ways to go because you're not there yet. I'm not there yet. I I'm, at least I'm sane enough to know this, at least I've got enough common sense to know this, is I'm not there yet. I've got a ways to go. I haven't run out of road. I've got more road to go, right? All of us. Well, I'm, I'm not called to the ministry. Everybody's called to the ministry. You're called to being a light to this world. You're called to, to be able to give uh, an answer to anybody who would ask. You're called to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You're called to do all kinds of things, to be an influencer spiritually. You're called to be an encourager, to be a deliverer. You're called to do that. 
You're called to give wise words to those that are foolish. You're called to that. But, Lord, I don't want to do it. That's the problem. That's really the problem. If you want to grow, God says, I've got room for you to grow. If you want to grow, God says, I have a program for you to grow. If you don't want to grow, God says, I can't do a thing with you because it's your heart. Your heart's the problem. Do you have a heart that says, forget about what I want, God. What do you want? Do you have a heart that says, Lord, I want to do your will? He goes, I want you to grow. You see, I don't know if Abraham was saying, Lord, I want to do your will. But I do know that the Lord told him, here's my will. Get up and go. And Abraham didn't say no. He said yes. So God may ask you to do something that you're not even expecting. He's going to ask you to do something that's going to take you out of your comfort zone, get you out of your familiar surroundings. But are you willing to step out and do what he asks you to do? If you're willing to step out and do that, then why don't we just say a prayer together of commitment? Now, here's the thing, is you cannot mean a prayer when you say it, but God will still hold you to the words of it. Did you know that? I'll say it, but I don't mean it. God says, yeah, but I heard the words. You made a promise to me. You make a vow, you keep it, right? You make a vow to the Lord, you keep it. You go, I don't feel like it, so I was just kidding. The Lord says, I'm not kidding. You signed on the dotted line, it's there. We're going to make a commitment to the Lord. And we're going to say it out our mouths. Okay? So, let's say this together. Heavenly Father, I'm your son. Yeah, or daughter. I'm your servant. I belong to you. All that I have belongs to you. All that I have left belongs to you. The time ahead of me belongs to you. All the plans for my life belong to you. I may have my own plans, but right now I surrender those to you. And I say, Father, I want your plan for my life. I turn away from my own ways. And I turn to you. And I say, Father, if you speak, I will obey. If you will say go, I will go. If you say do, I will do. If you say stand still, I will do that too. But from now on, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to let you make my decisions for me. I'm going to let you guide my path because you're the only one that knows where we're really, where we're really going. <laughs> you're the only one that can take me into your perfect plan, into the land you promised for me. You're the only one that can make me the person that you intend me to be. So I surrender my will to you, my life, my possessions, my future. Everything now is in your hands. And I say, Lord, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, as I said... Even if you didn't mean that, the Lord means it. The Lord heard it, and the Lord wants to hold you to it. And you go, oh, hey, that's so hard. You know, all these things that the Lord asked people to do were hard things. You know, getting up out of your own country, your own land with all your stuff and moving to a place you don't know, that's hard. Being Gideon and facing the Midianites, that's hard. Being David and facing Goliath, that's hard. But in everything God asked someone to do, he said, it's so that I can bless you. So this is so God can bless your life. Because you might think you live a blessed life now, but God says, I got a lot more for you. I want to bless you more than you ever thought possible. But it only comes if you continue to move forward. So let's move forward with the Lord. Well, thank you for coming. I hope to see some of you at prayer tomorrow night. You go, oh, that's a guilt trip. 
Well, let the Holy Spirit convict you. How's that? You can't call that a guilt trip. You can call that God's leading, okay? But God's going to lead us to pray. You say, well, I've got an important game to watch. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm tired. You know, I'm tired is a good excuse that people use on Wednesday nights a lot, and I can't tell you how many people are tired every single Wednesday night, except for the ones that come to prayer a lot, or come to Bible study a lot of times. A lot of times they walk away energized. Because God will restore you when you give, when you, do, when you give up your own thing for God's thing. He will bless you. He'll restore you. He'll multiply your time. He'll multiply your blessings. I come Wednesdays, even when I used to work full time, I come Wednesdays. And you know what? God always blessed me for coming Wednesdays. God always blessed me every time I showed up. Well, God will bless you if you show up. So, God bless you for showing up today. We're glad to see your faces are here today and that you have come to hear the word of the Lord today. And we just pray in Jesus' name a blessing over you right now. Father, I just pray over these folks your blessing over their lives, over the day to come, over the things ahead that you've set before them. I pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and boldness in everything they face, that when you say step out of your comfort zone, they'll be willing to do it, Lord, because you have a plan for their lives, a perfect plan, and it's a plan to multiply them, to bless them, to give them exceedingly abundantly above all they've ever asked for or thought about. And I just thank you, Father, right now that we are a people that are going to be led by you from this point on in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.